OTB Familia, welcome back. Episode 20, our season finale. We have lots to talk about to get today. The investigation into the Trump Organization has taken a turn, and we have the scoop right here for you guys. And we're seeing posts all over social media about what is currently going on in the West Bank. Today, we're going to be talking to someone who actually lives in the region. And we are so excited to have a very special guest, Maria Elena Salinas. Hello, so happy to join you guys. Very excited about the conversation. It will be a lot of interesting things to talk about tonight. Looking forward to it. All right, fam, let's get started with our rapid fire analysis. All right, let's begin with the story that everyone is talking about today. The New York Attorney General's office announced that they are investigating the Trump Organization in a criminal capacity, along with the Manhattan DA. As you may recall, the probe has looked into whether the Trump Organization misled lenders and insurance companies about the value of properties and whether it paid the appropriate taxes. JP, another scandal for ex-President Trump. Has there been any reaction on his behalf or on behalf of the Trump Organization? This is something he's very used to. Over the years, we've become privy to many of the legal problems he's had, but we also know that Trump has legal counsel that is very formidable and is used to being able to protect not only his assets, but also the way in which these cases are settled out of court. In the 70s, he had the housing discrimination case during his presidency. He had many people coming after him after he won the presidency and was able to claim presidential immunity. Now he's no longer the president. So now we're seeing all these claims come out. And what we're seeing right now in the state of New York is actually something that is rare. We're seeing local and state officials work together under this investigation under different claims. Trump University, tax fraud, insurance claims, various different claims with different assertions, but the prosecutors are working together. Whether or not this is going to come to fruition where Trump is actually going to have to come to terms with being found guilty of any of these charges, we will see. But one thing we know for certain is that this is something that we haven't seen a president go through this vigorously right after he exited as president. And what we'll be talking about later is how this is going to affect if he does decide to run in the future. Yeah, there's been a lot of firsts with uh, former President Trump. Wadi, we've also been hearing a lot in the past weeks about the pre uh, former President Trump uh, preparing to make a political comeback. How do you think this will affect his comeback? And do you think the Republicans will still support him? Uh, look, I'm going to keep this very simple, Claudia, because it is. The fact is that his supporters will continue uh, to remind everyone that he's been a president who saw us through a great economic boom pre-pandemic. Uh, they're not going to turn their backs on him. Those who have never liked the president will continue to not like the president. I mean, these are you either sort of fall in one of these two camps, either you're sort of pro-Trump or anti-Trump. And if you feel very strongly in one of these two areas, uh, the reality will continue to be that this probe, this investigation is not going to change much for you. So at the end of the day, if, if Donald Trump is looking at a comeback, uh, this investigation is not going to be one that's going to hold him back. Yeah, his followers aren't going to care. They didn't care about everything that came under during his four years during his administration. His followers aren't going to care. That's true. The Trump stands will remain. I'm pretty sure of that also. All right, guys, let's move on to another uh, important topic. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict has entered its 10th day. The Hamas-run Gaza Ministry of Health said that at least 219 people, among them 63 children, have been killed and 1,500 others have been injured. This is something the entire world is watching. However, not everyone understands the conflict. Wadi, how would you explain this to those people so that they understand what is happening? Claudia, I wish I had a very easy couple of one-liners to give and to explain uh, what's going on. But, but the reality is that it's very complex. Uh, to me, understanding uh, what we're seeing between Israel and Palestine uh, cannot fall into the scope of just the events that we've seen in the last few weeks. I remember I, I had a chance to go to Israel and into Palestine uh, two years ago. And the reality is that you do see areas uh, where, the, where there's physical barriers between the West Bank 
um, and then areas of Israel. There are also Palestinians who are citizens uh, of Israel and live in Israel and, and uh, participate as part of that society. Uh, but again, we have to look at the full scope of the history. We have to look at the roles that Jordan and other Arab nations like Egypt played uh, during the time that Israel was originally becoming a nation in that area. But look, the one thing I'd like to emphasize to me, this is not about being pro-Israel and then meaning you have to be anti-Palestinian. If you're pro-Palestinian, in my opinion, that does not mean you have to be anti-Israeli. I- I'm seeing, in my opinion, too many posts and too many people uh, that are presenting a false choice where it's one or the other. In my opinion, there are areas where Israel probably has stepped over the line and needs to uh, be better when it comes to coming to peace. Same thing when it comes to Palestine. Uh, there are areas where they've crossed the line and where they need to meet in the middle. I, I think the one area where I think a lot of people find agreement is that Hamas uh, has taken advantage of some of these events in order to uh, move their agenda uh, a little bit further, but at the same time, Hamas is not in charge of all of Palestine. So not all Palestinians can be judged, in my opinion, uh, by the actions of Hamas. Thank you, Wadi. Definitely praying for peace over there, Israel and Palestine. JP, what will it take to bring a ceasefire? Well, there's recent news that both sides are working together for a ceasefire. On the Palestinian front, what they're asking for is that sacred religious mosques are no longer entered into by Israeli authorities. On another note, they're also asking that the resettlement claims evacuating Palestinians no longer happen. Whether they're going to be able to come to terms on those, we're going to have to wait and see what both sides decide. But here's my biggest thing. This show is called Outside the Box, right? And one of the biggest reasons we started this show is because on social media, everything gets heightened, everything gets amplified. And oftentimes we limit our opinions and our resolutions and what we think of a situation just based off an Instagram post or an IG story. I think one of the things that I really, really enjoyed these last two days is on Clubhouse, I was able to join an audio chat where Palestinians and Jews came together to talk about the conflict in very rational ways. It did get testy. Some people were offended. Some people definitely shared exactly how they felt about both sides. But if that, if anything, shows exactly what we need, not only within this conflict, but in this world as a whole, yes, Wadi said it perfectly. Both these sides have decades and years of conflict that if you just isolate it to this one situation, you're limiting perspective and scope and also limiting the ability for public pressure on the UN to act correctly. So my biggest takeaway from this is Israel and Palestine, we're praying for you. And we hope that those are in power and that have the microphone to amplify your messages aren't doing it for the wrong reasons. Thank you both for all that information. And Chicos, I also want to ask you, what has been the reaction? action of the United States. Yeah, I think, you know, I'll add, I, I think uh, JP's point can't go overemphasized. Here in the United States, uh, it's no secret that there are movements in different areas. There's a lot of interest behind human rights. There's a lot of interest behind uh, justice. Uh, but JP hit it on the nail. We have to, I think, I'd sometimes be careful. There, there is an importance and there is a lot of injustice across the country and across the world, the globe. And, and we we should amplify that. But here in the United States, I have seen a lot of people really taking sides, sort of going to one camp or the other. It, it's either, again, you're either pro-Israel, you're pro-Palestine. And I believe that false choice that we're seeing a lot of people take on social media, to me, in my opinion, it's a little bit dangerous. And what I would like to see here in the conversation when it comes to the community is, 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 is an opportunity of learning. I don't think we're all experts on the history of Israel and Palestine or the history of the Middle East when it comes to these two nations. I, I think we're, we're going to continue to look to our leaders, uh, uh, the Biden administration, uh, to see what steps they take in trying to bring priests into that area. But it's not all, it's not on, all on U.S. leaders. It it's definitely comes down to the leaders of uh, Israel and Palestine to take these steps forward. Thank you, Wadi. JP? Yeah, people are calling to question the years of support from the U.S. to Israel. And like I said earlier, 
that's easily summed up in one headline where yes, the US has contributed billions of dollars, but what you don't take away is the Middle East conflict that's happened over decades and why the US has had to intervene. Let's remember for many years in the past, and I'm talking 30, 40 years ago, okay? I'm not talking recently. Uh, the US did not want to get involved in conflicts in the Middle East. And it took a lot of scope. It talk, took a lot of Jewish leaders here in the US to convince leaders to actually enter into the, that, those conflicts and those continuous conflicts that are gonna happen in the future. But um, that's what we're seeing is those billions of dollars. Are, is there a way to have more transparency, more checks and balances between the actions that Israel takes if the US is heavily supplying their military budget? We'll see what happens. Thank you guys. And Wadi and JP, you guys also had the chance to talk to a young Israeli vlogger and a video producer yesterday, Idan Matal, Matalon, excuse me. And he, he walks you guys through what it's, it's like living there uh, during in the region and during a time like this. So we're gonna take a look at that. And right after we have our interview with Maria Elena Salina. So stay tuned for that one too. Touched upon the political aspects of this conflict, but now we want to turn over and give a little bit of focus more on the human element of what's going on. Joining us on Outside the Box show is Israeli producer and video blogger Idan Matalon. You've seen his videos over, all over social media about what's currently going on in Israel. Idan, welcome to Outside the Box. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me here. Idan, tell, tell us how you're doing. Uh, so I'm here in uh, Israel, uh, in the southern part of Israel, and um, the last nine days are definitely tough for all of us, the Israelis. Um, we have more than 3,000 uh, rockets uh, from Gaza. Uh, luckily, we have the Iron Dome, but still we need to go uh, very often to the secure room or shelter. Uh, so it's definitely a, a big deal for us. Uh, People are not in the streets. It's not that uh, um, safe right now. Um, we, if you go to a grocery store, you need to think twice or you need to do it fast in between the alarms. And obviously people are not going to work, no school, nothing. You just need to stay home. I'm here for 24 seven in my parents' house. Um, yeah, not easy at all. Yeah, and it really sounds like the day to day has shifted and, and you are a video blogger and you uh, I have a big focus on social media. So I want to ask you two questions. One, uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you are geographically for, uh, you know, where are you in relation to Tel Aviv or to Gaza or the West Bank? And uh, apart from your location, uh, if you're able to share that, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about what is it that you're documenting now? For those who maybe don't follow you on social media, what is it that uh, you are showing the world uh, through your videos and through your blogs? Sure. Um, so I'm 35 minutes uh, souther from Tel Aviv. So that means that I'm even closer to Gaza. That's why we have more alarms here and more rockets uh, in the last uh, nine days. Um, so for me, um, it's kind of a situation that I can show the world. Uh, most of my followers are Latinos and the U.S. Uh, people. Um, so I'm trying to show them life right now uh, during a, let's call it war. Um, every alarm, I'm, I'm, I'm showing uh, the situation with my family. I have two uh, um, uh, primos. Look, now, cousins. I, now I'm speaking Spanish instead. Yeah, uh, like cousins. <laughs> um, so and they're like three and, and five years old. And so it's kind of... A, a challenge for us with them and four dogs and uh, my, 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 my father that it's a uh, not that healthy person. So we have, and my sister and everyone in the same house, um, need to run to the uh, secure place, uh, room. And, um, I'm trying to document everything. Also my family and myself explaining in between the alarms, the situation. I have so many questions, so many people from, uh, let's call it America. I don't really understand the conflict and the situation. I do, I try not to get too much uh, in politics. I do want to show and share them what I'm been, what I, I, I have here, what's my uh, experience from that. And I feel like it's enough because sometimes when you are involving too much political uh, things, 
so people don't really understand uh, your situation. Uh, they, they, people likes to see, it's not really likes to see in that situation, but people want to see uh, personal experiences, and this is what I'm trying to do on social media. Yeah, we've been seeing those social media videos all over here in the States, uh, specifically the videos with sirens. Um, they usually give you 10 to 15 seconds to find shelter after those alarms sound. Uh, Idan, what goes through your mind when those alarms go off? Um, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm always have, I always have this fear that it's going to catch me when I'm going to have showers. So we always... Uh, trying to get to have shower in a time that we feel that Hamas won't bomb us, which is weird. Uh, but um, in that, since I have my, uh, I can take my dogs, I can ask everyone to go to the secure room. Uh, so we do feel like we need, this is our obligation to be in a calm energy, not to be hysterical. Unfortunately, this is not the first time we have this situation. This time, I do believe, I do feel that it's uh, another level because everything is too extreme. If we're talking about the the sirens and the and the bombs and everything, it's it's much more in numbers. We have more than three thousand uh, rockets only in the last, and I think in three or two days it was two thousand. So it's getting less, wow. which I'm very happy about that. I can have a bit more of my life back, um, but uh, this is a. Uh, very uh you really feel that you are everything all, all your life depend on the alarm you know when it's going to happen and what you will do in between um so yeah i'm just trying to be relaxed for my family idan again so many details there and especially for us who uh, would never really think through having uh you know a safe house or a bunker here i, I wanted to ask you what is your message for those uh, individuals who still are trying to understand more of the conflict, who don't uh, know all the details. What would you say is your message to them? What should they understand? First of all, just before I will forget, I want to say that as a person that who lived outside of Israel for five years, I, I, I lived four years in, in Los Angeles, actually, and one year in Mexico City. I remember uh, this feeling that, okay, no wars here, no problems here. You guys have many, many other problems, but not these kind of problems. And it felt weird for me because I got used to a, a country that you always have some conflicts, right? Um, but my message in this case is that I know that pictures are terrible and people watching all the time pictures from Gaza. And I'm so sad about as a human being, it doesn't mean if I'm Israeli or Palestinian or from whatever in the world, as a person that felt that I'm global, you know, outside of Israel. So I'm, I'm, I do say about all the victims and all the innocent people. Uh, the problem here, and this is my message, people that don't really understand about the conflict, they see the pictures, they see dead people, they see dead uh, kids, but they don't understand how it's happening and why it's happening. It's really easy to, to blame the rocket that, for example, the Israeli sending rockets to bomb buildings of Hamas, but they need to understand the entire process. They need to understand that if people from Gaza will, would say, hey, we want peace with you guys, we will go and we're going to eat hummus with them in Gaza. It's happened before. My parents were visiting Gaza. It's a, there, there's like amazing beaches there. And I wish that someday I will visit Gaza with my, with my children and friends and eat hummus there. But right now we are dealing with a terror organization. We are not de dealing with something else. And it's exactly like ISIS and uh, Hezbollah from Lebanon and other terror organizations that killed uh, even from 9-11. Uh, it's the same, uh, unfortunately it's the same thing and people are dying because of that from both sides. And I just hope that someday it's gonna be over and no more terror organizations will be in the, in the entire world, not only next to Israel. And we're gonna have uh, the peace that we need. Thank you, Adan, thank you for sharing. Thank you for joining us in Outside the Box. If you wanna follow his Instagram where he's sharing his video blog content, at Idan M-A-T. I'm sure he'll be updating us as things go on. We wish you the best. Thank you for joining us and thank you for shedding light.
Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for letting me be with you and explaining more the situation. And tonight, we are putting someone we admire in the spotlight. We are very excited to welcome renowned journalists, both in Spanish language media and mainstream media. Maria Elena Selenas is joining us here tonight on the show. An absolute icon. Maria Elena, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to join you guys. Earlier, we were talking about the Trump organization being under investigation. How do you think that's going to affect his much rumored comeback, if at all? Oh, the investigation that I think is going to affect his comeback if he does come back, uh, because I think that it is pretty clear by now that people who support President Trump support him regardless of, of, of what happens to him, uh, regardless of what he does, regardless of what he says. Um, you know, he's very limited right now because he doesn't have social media, although he does put out um, statements every single day, sometimes more than once a day. I see that because, you know, I have access to the CBS email and I see the emails. It doesn't always make air. Uh, because he's just not president anymore. And, and his opinion uh, at this point on, on certain current events and certain people uh, are not news anymore. But for his followers, uh, he can do no wrong. And this investigation maybe could, you know, lead to criminal um, uh, indictments, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we have seen in the past that he seems to be able to get away with just about anything. So even if he were convicted, as he said in the beginning of his campaign, if I kill someone on Fifth Avenue, you know, they'll still love me. It's pretty true. And I think we have we have seen that and they have proven that. Thank you, Maria Elena. Those, you know, how the kids say now, those Trump stands are die hard for Trump. Um, yeah. I also want to ask you, it's been more than three years since you stepped down from your role uh, at Univision Noticias. What has life been like for you since then? Zen. <laughs> Relax. Well, a little bit less stress, let's say, than before. It's been interesting. You know, one of the reasons I left for several reasons, but one of the reasons is I wanted to own my own time and I wanted to work at a different pace. And I wanted to work more on passion projects than, than anything else. And, and I have been able to do that. I've done a lot of different projects. I worked on, on my series on investigation discovery. Uh, I was able to travel quite a bit also. And Almost two years ago, I started uh, being a contributor for CBS News. And as a contributor, um, I, you know, I do maybe 10 stories a year across all platforms, um, many of them long form. So it makes me very happy that I'm able to do that. Also, that I was able to cover the election for CBS News from Super Tuesday to the conventions to election night. And, and that's been one of my dreams um, to have mainstream media pay attention to our stories in elections to pay attention to the importance of our vote. And a lot of the stories that I have done have accomplished just that, for there to be a light, shining a light on our stories, on our issues, on our not, not just our, our, our problems, but also some of our contributions. So, you know, it's been pretty gratifying up to now. Maria, I think many of us have uh, followed your career during that time in, in Univision and be it election night, be it uh, State of the Union or breaking news, we have seen you there. But uh, I think such a remarkable thing that I'd like to, to ask you about is that switch to, to CBS, right? Now working with uh, folks like Ed O'Keefe uh, and special uh, coverage. I remember seeing some of the items when you guys were analyzing uh, that Latino vote, everything from uh, the surprises in Florida to what we saw in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, for those who are listening and that are thinking of either switching a movement in their careers or possibly moving from Hispanic media to mainstream media, what are some of the challenges that you encountered and what's uh, a piece of advice that you would give the audience? Well, you know, I, I think it's still an uphill battle for mainstream media to realize the importance of, of Latino stories. Uh, I think just like the politicians, sometimes we're still perceived as if we were foreigners. Uh, we're still perceived as people who don't speak English. I mean, uh, today I was watching CNN and they were talking about access to vaccines among Hispanics and why isn't there more information in, in Spanish, uh, maybe forgetting that three quarters of Latinos are bilingual and they speak English also. So, you know, I, I didn't exactly leave one job to go to another. I, I, uh, that was not my plan. It just turned out that way. Uh, but one thing that I learned when I started working at CBS is that news is news no matter what language it is. Um, you know, it, it, it's 
it's important. It's, um, uh, you know, the focus is important. The perspective is important. Maybe one of the things that is different is, is the type of, uh, uh, of slant or focus that we give, you know, that in Spanish language media to us, uh, Latino stories are very important and we are sort of like advocate for Latinos. Advocating for anyone is a no-no in mainstream media. Um, uh, but that has also changed because I think ever since the, you know, George Floyd murder, there's been a little bit of change out there with news directors, whether it be in television or, or in print, that are beginning to notice that people, that minorities, that people of color, reporters of color, uh, do have a perspective that's important to include in their stories because they know their own communities. When before it used to be, no, don't cover it because you will be, you know, you won't be objective, you'll be biased. Um, but I think that that is also changing. So, I mean, if, if, if what you're asking for is advice, is, you know, know what you want and try to understand the difference between the two. And the difference between the two maybe are some of the types of stories that that you might cover. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say in the case of CBS that it's bigger than Univision because Univision was very big. Um, but it, um, you know, it, it's another language, but news is news. And journalism, good journalism is good journalism. Yeah, perspective is everything. That's why my co-host and I, we started outside the box and, and commenting on so many issues that affect our community because yeah. we do feel passionately about immigration, but we also feel so passionately about so many other topics. That's why we're so grateful to see you as an example on television, on CBS, seeing you do great journalistic work. On that same note, you've been able to accomplish something that many people aspire to do with one language. You've now done it with two languages in English and Spanish. What's next? What, what, what's on your bucket list? Oh, you know, um, there's a lot of things I want to do. I want to produce. Um, and, and I have been working out for years and developing uh, programming, creating content for streaming. And, you know, it, it's one step at a time and I'm advancing a little bit more and more. Uh, as you know, people don't even watch television anymore. I'm sure that most of you probably don't have cable. Maybe your parents have cable. I know my daughters in my house, we have four TVs and only the ones I watch have cable and my daughters don't. So, you know, the important thing is to be able to do to to to, to have a, a telephone in which uh, people can watch my. Oh, by the way. It's. The dreamers, mm -hmm. <laughs> the dreamer signal on my phone. Um, so anyway, sorry <laughs> to get off the subject, but uh, I think that we need to adapt to the new times and the new times are um, the medium and the platform and the platform is digital. The platform is telephones and, 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 and Facebook and, uh, and, and your, you know, your iPad, uh, not even your laptop anymore. I mean, your iPad is in, in, in your iPhone. So I want to be able to do the types of shows, preferably long form that, um, that you can stream, that you can see that way. So, but I want to do it in, in production. And of course, you know, I'm a storyteller. I have covered the world and I, I know that I can cover any story, but I do have a special interest in telling our stories. Because it just dawned on me when I was at Univision that, you know, Spanish language TV is so good at telling our stories. But at times I feel like we're preaching to the choir that our stories need to be told to different audiences and different platforms. Uh, because as I mentioned before, and I think that's one thing that I think I pretty much have proven and, con and confirmed um, during the time that I have been working at, at CBS and, and, and on other projects, that, you know, we have a long way to go as a community uh, to be recognized. Um, we're growing, but our recognition isn't growing with our numbers. We're already the largest minority. We're already the second largest voting bloc in the country. Uh, yet, our stories are not being told with the with the, you know with the amount of veracity that they should be told. You know, uh, so I, I'm just hoping to be able to push. I mean, that is that is my mission now. You know, ever since I started my career, and I've said this many times in the past. Ever since I started my career, I realized that I found my passion and I turned it into my mission. So because I left the university doesn't mean that my mission ends. On the contrary, my mission continues and now it even grows. And, and to me, it's very important to tell Latino stories, to tell the Latino story, no matter how small the group, 
whether it's 10 people, whether it's a thousand people, whether it's a million people, I just want to have that opportunity because I, I just feel that, you know, my community is so important to me. It's so ingrained in me. And we have such deep roots in this country. I mean, just think about it. Spanish was spoken before English in the U.S. Um, yet, uh, I don't think that we're getting the recognition and the respect that we deserve as a community. And that is part of my mission. And I do it through my civic engagement activities, but I want to do it through the media too. So that is my goal. And thank you. you know, sometimes you have to take a step back to be able to take two steps forward and, and you have to knock on a lot of doors and you have to have a lot of patience. Thank God I have That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Thank God you do because you really are paving the way for us. Uh, you've paved the way, you know, for men, for Latinos, men and women, for myself as a woman in this industry, um, you've paved the way for all of us. And I really want to ask you, what would your advice be for those of us who are starting off in, in this industry? Well, you know, it, it, it's changed a lot since I started, you know, first of all, there's just a lot more outlets. I know it's very challenging because there's so many people that want to be journalists and there's only a limited amount of positions. But one thing that I have realized is that uh, young people are just taking it upon themselves. And you are the perfect example of that. I remember in interviewing, uh, I think it was Maria Hinojosa, years ago on a panel where she said something that really stayed with me. She said, one day I decided that if they won't publish you, I'll publish myself. And that is what you guys are doing. It doesn't mean that no one wants to publish what you're doing right now. I'm sure they do. But you're not waiting for someone to come and do it. You're doing it on your own. And that is a great thing about journalists at this moment, that you are taking the initiative, that there's a lot of outlets, that there's a lot of platforms where you can do it on your own and where you can start building that, whether you call it a resume or start building your brand. Um, and, and building a brand really is what now we want to do. Why can't we each be you know, our, own, our, our own brand and, and do our own thing and become our own companies and become our own bosses? and get the amount of following that advertisers look for. And why do I bring in advertisers in all of this? Because, you know, this is a business after all, and any business uh, uh, of broadcasting, um, whether it's on television, uh, on broadcast or, or streaming, you know, it has to be supported and it has to be financed. So whether it's a foundation, whether it's advertisers, whether it's just philanthropy donors, uh, you know, you want to be able to attract those people by offering uh, the best of what you have to give, by putting your best face forward, by putting your community's best face forward, by putting your best work forward, and by being creative. Um, so really, there's no limit. You know, I, I, I there's times when I feel, uh, you know, I feel bad because it's tough out there. I mean, the job market is tough for everyone, and, and including in the media. Um, and at the same time, for, for journalists, there's, are they're constantly under attack. Not only is their credibility being put into question, but also you see so many small local newsrooms being closed down, shut down, or, or having their uh, budgets reduced. And, you know, and, and young journalists not having that opportunity to showcase their, their work. So, so I do worry. But then, again, I remind myself that I really believe in the resilience of, uh, of my gener of your generation, not my generation, your generation. <laughs> That's very uh, sound advice, Maria. And I want to ask you in your earlier uh, answer, you, you talked about sort of your passion uh, for telling the stories of our community and making sure that those stories are rightly represented in the media. Uh, but another place where the stories of Latinos uh, need representation is uh, in government. And I wanted to ask you, has it ever crossed your mind possibly uh, to run for office, to get involved in, in politics front and center? Absolutely not. No, politics <laughs> is not for me. I've always had a lovely <laughs> relationship with politics, and I really would prefer to be on this side of politics and being an observer and being a critic and being, uh, you know, asking the questions than, than, than being in government, uh, especially right now. I mean, government is, um, at this point, is, is, uh, is really ugly, you know? It, it's... It's supposed to be a civic duty. It's supposed to be a service to your community. And it has turned into, you know, a, a very nasty, rude uh, fight. Um, you know, 
struggle to get your voice out there, constantly being having to be on the defensive. Um, and, and you know, to be honest with you, I I know it's not all of them, but some politicians sometimes have to you know bow to special interest because they need to get the donations in order to be reelected. They need money to be reelected. Um, but no, politics is not something that I want to be involved in at all, at least not as a politician. I am still very passionate about covering politics and, and questioning those who are in power and making sure that the people that they are trying to serve understand what that politician has to offer and hopefully make sure that the politician understands the needs of those they want to elect them. On that same note, uh, you mentioned earlier that you're, you're used to fielding the questions. What's one question that you've never been asked, but you often wish people did? God, I don't know. I get asked a lot of questions. I don't know that there's something. Um, I mean, maybe who I am. You know why? Because I think that there's times when all of us fall into this. We see each other as what we do and not who we are. And, you know, I am not just a journalist. I am a woman. I am a mother. I am a sister. I am a Mexican. I want to be me. And I think that's one of the things that makes me feel good about being on my own and being an independent journalist now. Uh, having that opportunity um, to just be me and, and uh, you know, not to say that while I was working at Univision, I wasn't, because I think one of the most important things that you can do is, um, you know, is, is be transparent, is be honest, is be, be yourself when you are communicating with people, because that's how you gain people's trust. And, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to gain the trust of, uh, of, of so many people. And, and how do I know that? I know that through social media, you know, that's, there's good things and bad things about social media. There's some people that hide behind, uh, you know, their avatar and, and, and just spew out hate. But then there's a lot of people that that just communicate with you and tell you how you feel. So it wasn't until I left that I realized that maybe I had made an impact in somebody's life. Um, before that, you know the ratings. I mean, you know, there's X amount of people that are watching you. Maybe you know where they're watching you. You might even know how old they are. You might even know what income level they are, but you don't know what they think. Of you. you don't know what they feel. You don't know what they need. You don't know, you know, if, if, if the work that you're doing, that you and your team are doing day to day is uh, really impacting their lives. And, and I realized that it was, and, and, and it was the biggest satisfaction that I could ever leave with. I mean, it's, I, I'm telling you the day that I left and I, and I saw those messages, I cried till three in the morning because it was, it really touched me because I didn't realize that. Um, and then I became me and, and, and then I, I was beginning to be more comfortable with, you know, not just the journalist, but also the woman who is very committed to her community because I'm committed to my community, not because I'm a journalist, but because I am one of those people that I was reporting to. I am also the daughter mm -hmm. of immigrants, of Mexican immigrants. I am also, you know, someone who started working when I was 14 and, and you know, came up the ranks. I'm also someone that, that, that has been dreaming about, um, you know, progressing in life. So I felt that I was part of the community that I was reporting to, and I still feel that way. I just happen to be on this side of the camera, but I'm no different than the people that I'm talking to. I love that you say that, Marielena, because it is true. People see you on camera and they do think you're that journalist. They don't, they don't understand the the humanity of of you know people in general. Whether you're a politician, a journalist, a celebrity, we are all human. And I love that you brought that up. And speaking of our dreamers, because you have so many dreamers, what would you say to um, those people that feel like they're stuck at a at a at a job that they don't love and they want to switch gears and maybe find another career? Well, I'm telling you, I'm one that, uh, you know, living proof that you can reinvent yourself, that it's never too late to reinvent yourself, but it's also never too early to reinvent yourself. But, but one thing that is important, and, and I say that because I have a 23-year-old daughter who already wants to reinvent herself. She's only been working a year. Uh, so I have to be very careful. She says, well, you did it. Why can't I do it? Okay, I planned it, and I planned it for a long time. 
first of all, you have to be sure of what it is that you want to do next. I don't think it's a good idea to be inside a career and say, I don't like this anymore, I'm going to leave. Where are you leaving to? I don't know, figure it out. Well, you can't really figure it out. When you get to a certain age where you, um, where you have to figure it out before you leave where you are. But you need to take the steps. You have to go from dreaming about it, from thinking about it, to actually taking action and planning it and taking the necessary steps to get to where you want to go, where you're in the position that you're ready to move on to something else and to make that career change. If it is a career change, sometimes it's a life change. Sometimes it's a career change. Sometimes you want to move from one city to another. Some, you know, There's so many ways of changing your life. The important thing to know is that there is absolutely no reason why someone should be unhappy and have to put up with being unhappy, with being um, feeling uncomfortable in their job, uh, with being maybe um, discriminated against in their job, with not being valued in their job, uh, you know, whatever it is that is not making you feel like you are fulfilled, like you're making a difference, that, that you know, that you're actually uh, getting something out of it and giving something to this position, it's time to make a change. So raise your hand and say it. Don't just suffer quietly. I think I'm one who, who had, oh, has always raised my hand. Of course, in the beginning, when I first started my career, I didn't. I was so shy that it took me a year to raise my hand in press conferences and ask a question because I was afraid I was going to ask the stupid question. And when I realized that all the other reporters were asking the same questions I wanted to ask, I started raising my hand. And since then, I haven't. So I've always been outspoken when raising my hand and saying, I'm here. I can cover that story, too. Don't forget it's my turn to cover the story. I'm willing to take the risk and go to Iraq. I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to do that. In the beginning of my career, I said yes to everything. I said yes to every single challenge because that's how I thrive. I thrive on challenges. I didn't want to be the person that was gliding through life, you know, effortlessly pushing the easy button and expecting to get something out of it and expecting to, to, to succeed and get ahead. I always needed that challenge. I always needed to grow personally and professionally. When I feel that I am in a place where I am no longer growing, where there's just no space for me to go there, then I have to find somewhere else to grow. Even if I have to take two steps back, I mean, one step back to eventually take two steps forward. So yeah, reinvent yourself. I'm all for it, but plan it. Prepare yourself for it in every way that you can. Then take action. Wow, thank you so much for joining us on this <laughs> show. On behalf of my co-hosts and I, you're not only an icon, but you're just an absolute example. You could have easily gone and sailed and off, off into the sea after finishing your Spanish language career in media, but you're out there setting the example and opening doors for, for aspiring journalists and not just in media, but in other industries as well. Because when we see our gente, when we see our people on that television screen, it inspires us to aspire for more. So on behalf of our co-hosts, Thank you so much for joining us on Outside the Box. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much. Thank you for inviting me. And it was great and advice. Congratulations to the three of you for doing what you're doing. It's great. Keep on doing it. And I wish you the best of luck and the best success. OTB fam, that was it for season four. How? How is that it for season four? I can't believe we've been doing this for so long. We have been meeting like this weekly for so long. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. What an amazing season. We're coming up to over 600,000 views. And what that means is that you as an audience have been engaged. What it means is that there's a lot of topics that we have covered. We're very excited to have you as part of our community. And we're very excited because there is going to be a comeback, and, and JP has more details on that, but very excited to be part of this with you guys. 600,000 views. Let's keep on going. We're so grateful. This, um, this show was born during the pandemic, during some very dark times. I want to say thank you to everyone who's involved in this project real quick. Uh, first, my co-hosts, uh, the two co-hosts that join every week with their heart. Um, that do research. We don't, we're not experts on all, everything we talk about, but we do care about what's impacting this world. I want to, uh, the team behind the camera as well. Um, George, thank you so much on a weekly basis for everything you do. 
Um, and everyone else who's involved with this project, my little brother, Josh, who helps. I know our families, the co-host families as well. Um, let me thank <laughs> them as well, because they're just as much involved in this progress from husbands to moms, to grandmas, to tias. Um, thank you for making the show as successful. Wadi just said 600,000 views from an idea with absolutely no audience, no third party distribution. This is a true testament to our comunidad believing in this next generation that is way more um, capable of doing so many more different things than we could ever imagine. So let's go with that energy. Let's go with that. We'll be back in a couple months. You can follow us on Instagram at OTB show and we'll see you there. Take care.